what's up guys my name is Zach and today I am driving a 2007 Ford Mustang Shelby GT500 up front is a 5.4 liter supercharged V8 and down below is a six-speed manual gearbox and if you want to read more of my thoughts head on over to carmarshall.com slash overdrive where I'll be writing a complete review of this car but let's get back to that 5.4 liter V8 that's been supercharged. You gotta love a supercharged V8, right? I mean, that's just America in a nutshell. <laughs> now let's talk about the transmission. Honestly, I'm not the biggest fan. It just, it doesn't feel that exact. It doesn't feel that you know, to the point. It's not like, honestly, I'm going to say it, it's not like a Honda gearbox where it's all click, 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 click. You know, it's, it feels like a stick in gravel. I mean, really, it feels kind of sloppy. And this car has 11,000 miles on it. So it's not like this thing's been used and abused in its 11 year life. It's just, that's pretty much how it is. That being said with the transmission, this clutch is heavy. This thing is heavy. It might be one of the heaviest clutch clutches I've ever dealt with. But at the same time, it's actually a really forgiving clutch. It's not a really aggressive biting clutch, if that makes sense. It's just physically a lot to move with your foot. I was actually really afraid of stalling this car just because I was afraid of, you know, not finding that sweet spot with the, uh, with the clutch. But actually, I've been driving it for four minutes now, and uh, it's great. It's honestly hasn't been, uh, hasn't been an issue. It just really surprised me. I guess Ford clutches are just really a lot heavier than I expect because uh, the Ford Focus ST that I reviewed um, also had a really heavy clutch for what it was. These gears are also really tall. Um, the owner, Paul, which thank you so much, Paul, for letting me do this review. Um, Paul says that he could do almost 60 in first gear. That's a really tall gear. So let's get to the interior. In front of me, I have gauges that seem to be pushed a mile away from me. They're in these really deep housings. And especially in the middle, there's like, it's, it's so deep. Like I have to dive into them to look at them. In the center, I have fuel, supercharger PSI, coolant temperature, and oil pressure. Then to the left, I have a speedometer. To the right, I have a tachometer, which says SVT, which stands for Special Vehicle Team, which is Ford's performance division from the 2000s. We got the SVT Lightning from them, SVT Cobra, SVT Contour, which I actually reviewed. In the center, I have two vents that honestly look like they were just kind of tacked on there. In the center, it has an aftermarket radio, hazards, air conditioning, and that's really it. Guys, this interior is really basic. I mean, really basic. Another weird thing about this interior, I don't know if it'll come into view. This handbrake is so freaking tall. I do enjoy the Shelby GT500 badge on the center of the steering wheel. I think that's a nice touch. As well as the badges on the outside, I really like the look of this car. The grill with the snake on it, the snake badges on the side, I think that's really cool. And I think this is definitely one of the better looking Mustangs to come out of the 2000s era. Don't even get me started about SN95s. The seats are pretty comfortable. Rear seats have no leg room. Um, it's, really, it's really not a four seater. In a pinch, sure, you could probably fit a kid or two back there. But really, this is, uh, this is not a four-person car. One interesting thing is that these little rear half windows are both controlled by the same switch. So you can't have one open and one closed. Really don't know why you would do that. Um, but it's interesting that it's only controlled by one switch. If you do want to fold the roof down, there's two tabs on either side. You pull those out, and then there's a button, and it automatically retracts. So let's get back to the fact that this is a Mustang, and actually this is the first Mustang I've reviewed on the channel. Now I've driven one before, I've driven a 1984 Fox Body 5.0 convertible in stick shift, but that was 
that's really my only other Mustang driving experience. And honestly, I understand why these cars are so popular. I just wouldn't buy one myself. The, I think the reason these cars are so popular is because they're an easy go-to answer. That's, that's my answer with a lot of Ford products. It's the same idea with the F-150 is that everyone recognizes the name Ford. Everyone knows the story of Henry Ford, who actually never lived to see a Mustang produced. Ford is such a household name that when someone's like, okay, I want to buy a performance car, the Ford Mustang is nine times out of ten the first thing to come to mind. And there's something to be said about that. I'm not saying it's like a cheap way out or whatever. I'm saying it's so iconic, it's so recognizable, it's so popular that its own popularity builds on its popularity. It's like the popular kid in school being popular for being popular. Or the Kardashians. I don't really know what's going on there, but I'm pretty sure their fame has just built onto their fame. And I'm not really sure what they're famous for. This car is such a cult following, and if you're a big Mustang fan, I'd highly recommend checking out the documentary A Faster Horse. It's on Netflix, it's on YouTube. Super, super interesting documentary. It is about the development of the 2015 Mustang, as well as a history of the Mustang. And I love stuff like that. I love all the politics that went into it. Like how Henry Ford II really wasn't a fan of the Mustang. Uh, and Lee Iacocca, who is God's gift to the automotive industry, really swooped in and made the Mustang happen and all this stuff. It's a really interesting documentary. So if you guys have time, uh, it's about, I think it's an hour and a half. Um, check out A Faster Horse. This review also marks another interesting milestone for my reviews, which is now... I've reviewed a supercharged Camaro, supercharged Challenger, and a supercharged Mustang. And what are my thoughts on each? Well, it's not a directly fair comparison because there's almost 10 years between the Challenger that I reviewed and this car that I reviewed. This is an 07, the Challenger I did was a 2016. And so there's a lot of advancements, and yes, the Hellcat Challenger was much, much faster. It was at this moment that Zach's opinion on the Mustang completely changed. Wow, is that squirrely! <laughs> wow! <laughs> that was squirrely! I'm not saying they're okay, but I kind of understand a lot of the Mustang videos now. I'd like to think that I'm a decently competent driver. No, I'm not a race car driver, and no, I haven't driven everything in the world, and I know I've only been driving for five years, but I've driven a lot of different things, and this might be the most squirrely car under hard acceleration I've ever driven. That really just blew my mind. Wow. That's all I could say is wow. That was... So between the Challenger, Camaro, and Mustang. How do I feel? Well, as you saw, the Mustang is by far the squirreliest. It's the rowdiest of the cars that I've driven. The Camaro felt the most, I want to say most precise, but the Camaro just felt purposefully built. It felt, the Challenger was all for show. The Challenger, the Hellcat's all about big numbers. It's about slamming it down on the table. I have 700 horsepower. What do you have? Not that? Ha ha. Sucks to be you. The Camaro that I drove had similar horsepower, but it wasn't showboaty. It wasn't braggy. And neither is the Mustang. The Mustang isn't that shouty or braggy, in my opinion. At least not as much as the Challenger. But there's something different between this and the Camaro. Not that either one is a better performing car it just they have very different feels I don't want this to sound crudely but I felt like the Camaro was built by a team of researchers you know like they had board meetings about the Camaro but the Mustang not that it's a build quality thing but this kind of feels like it was built in a shed down in Kentucky I mean it feels like something someone put together. It doesn't feel like a group of suit and tie executives planned all of this stuff out. 
And the reason I say that is I feel like no logical board meeting will end with, yeah, but the car will just go all squirrely and stuff when you floor it. All right, good meeting, let's get lunch. No logical group of people allow that to happen. Oh, come on. I, I now, I understand the Mustang videos. That was really eye-opening. The fact that it would not hold traction, and granted, it's 55 degrees today. It's by no means cold, but it's not the warmest. And it just, it really got away from me. Now I'm interested to drive a newer Mustang. If anyone out there would like me to review their newer Mustang, please let me know. Um, to see if, uh, to see if it's changed. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you guys learned something about the 2007 Mustang Shelby GT500. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to read my article, head on over to carmarshall.com. But don't forget to rate the video, comment on the video, and subscribe if you really liked it. Take care, guys. I, I, I,